Hello and welcome to another virtual session of Sunday School or Bible Study at the Hernando, Florida Church of the Nazarene. I am Charles Seabolt, one of the adult teachers, and feel privileged to present this lesson to you today. I thank you for joining us for this study of God's Word, and I pray that we all shall benefit from today's study of the Third Commandment in our series on the Ten Commandments. We are looking at the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai as re the Israelites were on their journey from Egyptian slavery to the promised land of Canaan. We ask ourselves why were the Ten Commandments necessary for God's chosen people, or his new nation. Well, at the foot of Mount Sinai, God showed his people the true function and beauty of his laws. The commandments were designed to lead Israel to a life of practical holiness, and in them people could see the nature of God and his plan for how they should live. Last week, Mary, my wife, presented the lesson on the first two commandments recorded in chapter 20 of Exodus. Let me read those first four verses to you to review. Exodus 20, 1 through 4. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. Many of us are more familiar with these commandments in the King James versions, so I would like uh, in the course of our a study to give you uh, both versions. In the King James Version, the first commandment said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. God, being the creator and sustainer of the earth and the heavens and all that there is that has been created certainly wanted his people and wants everyone today to give first allegiance to him in their lives. So certainly these first two commandments were uh, very well placed as the beginning commandments. But today we look at the third commandment that is stated in verse 7 of Exodus chapter 20. The NIV reading says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. The King James Version says it this way, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. To not take God's name in vain means to not take it lightly and to never use God's holy name as a thoughtless hateful curse. This is perhaps the most common and lightly treated sin of today, as profanity is splashed all over our music, television shows, and movies. But God tells us to stop using blasphemy and filthy language and to bless rather than curse. 
So hopefully in today's lesson, as we look at this more closely, we shall see that we honor God's name, not just by the words we use, but also by the way we live. The importance of a name. We all know that our name given to us by our parents is important in identifying us as a member of the family. I hope you like your name. <laughs> there are some people who uh, do not like their birth name and have chosen to uh, change it somewhere in their adult life. But our surname especially gives us the identity that we have in a particular family. In Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet asks the question, what's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Our names identify us, as I said, belonging to a certain family. Well, in this play, Romeo was of the house of Montague and Juliet of Capulet, two families at fierce odds with each other. If Romeo had not been a Montague, the two would have been able to marry. A name can often carry immense meaning. There is more than one name used to refer to God in the original Hebrew and Aramaic languages of the Old Testament. English uh, translations use the term Lord, L-O-R-D, as a translation not just for one of these names, but for several names that are used for God in the original languages. The two most common names used in the Old Testament are the names Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E and Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-I. The difference uh, we can see in the translations by how the word Lord, L-O-R-D, is printed in our modern translations. When the word Lord, spelled capital L, small case O, R, and D, appears, the name is, it translates is Adonai. When Lord large capital L, and small capitalized O-R-D appears. The name it translates is Yahweh. It is the name Yahweh that is used in the important command of Exodus 27, the, 30, the third of the Ten Commandments. The Lord later says in Exodus, uh, or earlier said in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. God declared that his people should have forever call him Yahweh. This is God's covenant name representing God's steadfast commitment to the people of God. Deuteronomy 28.58 refers to Yahweh as God's glorious and awesome name. It was not to be misused also. Anyone who misused the name Yahweh, as our scripture says, would not be held guilt guiltless. Adonai and other Hebrew and Greek words that are translated Lord refer to honorable titles given to God. These usually refer to the many wonderful attributes or characteristics of God. 
these <clears throat> our modern culture though is steeped in misusing God's name. It is shameful that even Christians are sometimes too casual in their language and even perhaps using foul language and appending, appending the names of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to their cursing. God's name is special because it carries his personal identity. Usually it frivolously or in a curse uh, so commonly used today that we may fail to realize how serious it is. Now I may say some things as I continue on in this lesson that you may or may not agree with, but I hope that we will examine, or this lesson will cause us to examine, some of our casual speech, whereas many of us would not be prone to, uh, as Christians, uh, exuding uh, gross profanities uh, as a part of our speech patterns. There are some other misuses that I want to bring out that you might want to consider. The way we use God's name conveys how we really feel about him. We should respect his name and use it appropriately, speaking it in praise or worship rather than in curse or jest. We should not take lightly the abuse or dishonor of his name. Even today, many Jews, for fear of dishonoring his name, do not attempt to use or even pronounce God's name, referring to him simply as Hashem, H-A-S-H-E-M, which in Hebrew translates literally, quote, the name, unquote. This brings me now to a topic of what we call euphemisms. A common form of taking God's name lightly or thoughtlessly is using euphemisms for his name. I have been guilty, I confess. However, I read an article many years ago addressing this, and since then I have tried to be more careful in using some of these words or phrases that we would not consider out and out cursing, but are a softened version, you might say, of some of those words. Webster's Dictionary says that a euphemism is the use of a less direct word or phrase for one that is considered offensive. We have lots of those in our English language. Uh, one is, example is, uh, you're, the lady may say she's going to powder her nose, which means really that she's going to the restroom to do whatever. Or we might say that we have a negative cash flow, which really means we're broke. Might as well say it. Or we might say that someone has passed away rather than using the word die or died. Some euphemisms are considered polite. Some are funny but some can just be a way to try to say something considered wrong or offensive without being punished. Alternative swear words, while seeming less offensive or even funny, can still, at their heart, might be construed as profanity, swearing, or taking God's name in vain. As I said earlier, I'll repeat it again. 
You may not agree with all that I'm about to say, but I want you to think about these uh, euphemisms that I'm about to present to you. <clears throat> In our modern world, we hear this command violated overtly and frequently all around us with the word God, Jesus, Christ, or Lord, uttered merely as filler words, exclamations, expressions of anger or contempt, or in conjunction with cursing or profanity. One of the most pervasive abuses of the name of God is the phrase, Oh my, and you know what the third word is, which has become so commonplace it now has its own abbreviation, OMG, in the, on the text messaging platforms. In addition to blatantly saying God's names, there are euphemisms that have modified the same names into less explicit or softened forms. But because they are merely modifications of God's name, they likewise could be violations of the intent of the third commandment. And these are areas where we need to pray and follow the Spirit's leading. Have you ever used the word golly or gosh? I bet you didn't think that those were simply euphemisms for the word God. Have you ever used the word geez or gee whiz? These are simply euphemisms for Jesus or Christ. Have you used the phrase Jiminy Cricket or Jumpin' Catfish? <laughs> well, the beginning letters of those uh, two uh, of those words are J and C, which could stand for the initials of Jesus Christ. Or have you ever used the word lordy or lottie or laud, L-A-W-D, which are euphemisms for the word lord. The word holy is a word that refers to God's nature, his works, or anything God is present or involved in. And any use of this word in conjunction with any other word outside of its correct and proper context is a violation or of the third commandment. I've heard lots of people use the exclamation, holy cow, you know, when they couldn't believe that something was happening or believe what they were seeing or hearing. Another category of euphemisms that is inappropriate for Christians is to use it uh, in asking God to condemn or to damn, D-A-M-N, a person or thing. Did you ever think that euphemisms for the word damn are words like darn, dern, dang, doggone, uh, which the word doggone could be a euphemism for the two words God and the word damn. Jesus himself in the New Testament talked to us about our speech as well as other writers of the New Testament. And there are many, many scriptures we could cite if we had the time to do it. But Jesus, in his magnification of the spiritual intent of God's laws in the Sermon on the Mount, set the standard for uh, Christians. Christians should not swear. Their every statement 
should be as truthful and sure as if they had taken an oath. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 and onward, Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform our, your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. A hard teaching, but a teaching of Jesus himself to us. In Matthew 6, 9, Jesus in teaching us how to pray, begins the prayer by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, or respected, be thy name. One verse from Paul's writings, and again, there are many more verses that could be cited if we had the time. The Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul writes to the people at Colossae and says, But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Says it pretty plainly, doesn't he? Rid yourself of all such things. And the final thing there is filthy language from your lips. We do not have time uh, to look at uh, another scripture that was uh, given to us in our lesson material. Uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 36 verses 16 through 27. But I'll just kind of summarize uh, that for you. Ezekiel was a prophet of Israel who experienced the Babylonian captivity, which happened many hundreds of years after the giving of the Ten Commandments. Ezekiel made it plain in his prophecies that the Lord's name was not profaned by what the Israelites said, but by what they did. The third commandment has to do with our lived-out expressions of reverence for God. In his teaching or prayer, Jesus revealed that a reverence for God's name is essential so that we can approach God saying, as I said already, hallowed be your name. The third commandment is violated when God's people do not live according to his ways. The Lord himself tells us in this verse from Ezekiel 36, <clears throat> uh, verse 23, The nations will know that I am the Lord when I show myself holy through your eyes. People are watching us. They are not only listening to what comes out of our mouth, but they are watching how we live. The intent of this lesson, as I said before, is not to judge you or to make you feel guilty regarding some of your speech patterns for I am checking myself as well. Perhaps you disagree with some of the euphemisms that were stated. And I know that things that we have used for many, many, many years of our adulthood that have become habits in our speech patterns are hard to break. 
But the lesson is designed to cause us to think seriously about this third commandment. What does that third commandment say? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord or the name of Yahweh, thy God, in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. I encourage you to pray this simple prayer as I conclude this morning. Pray it this week and be sensitive to what God might show you about your speech patterns. And it simply says, Heavenly Father, I want to use your name only in ways that honor you. Please set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, and keep watch over the door of my lips. Help me never to say or do anything that dishonors your holy name. In your name I pray this. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. These are phrases taken from Psalm 141.3, if you'd like to refer to that. Next week, the Sabbath observance commandment we will look at. And I thank you today for watching, watching and listening. And may God bless each of you. Praise his name.